So, long story short, I found myself back at Oddly End one fine afternoon where it turns out my ginger biscuit making companion Hannah is now working as a historical interpreter herself, alongside Kathy Hipperson, who you might know better as the one and only Mrs. Crocum. I am supremely curious now to know a bit more about the world of historical interpretation, that is, bringing both classic and lesser known figures from history back to life. So, if you're curious to hear a bit more about all this as well, grab some hand sewing, knitting, a cup of tea or a pint, and join us down at the pub for a little living history chat. Hi friends! So we are sitting in a pub right now, as you can see, with this is Kathy Hipperson. If you do not know, this is the one and only Mrs. Crocum of the Victorian Way series, but we're not really going to be talking so much about Mrs. Crocum specifically, so much as yes, we're in a pub, so much as the general realm of living history. And this it's my friend Hannah, who you may recognize from, firstly, the video that we made this Almost time last ago. year on making ginger biscuits, Mrs. From, Crocum's ginger yes. biscuits, from which we then went to Audley End to meet Mrs. Crocum. Yes, we were so excited that not only you wanted to make them, but then you also wanted to come to Audley End. Yes, of course. So Hannah is now resident village girl at Audley End. <laughs> She's part of the team. Hannah lives here in England. She's training to be an actor. She's training to be an actor. Well, she was, and now she's graduated. Yeah. So it was just kind of perfect. They were in touch, and now Hannah works at Audley End. Some days, because it's all, you know, people get slotted into different days. Yes, we have a team of about 20 people who work there, and um, they all play different characters. Some of them play more than one character. There are six Mrs. Crocans, for example. I know. I know, shock. So Hannah plays Suki, the village girl, yes. who comes in to help out at the house sometimes, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. And sometimes Suki's mother comes in and helps. Sometimes I've heard a Welsh woman. Yes, comes Mrs. And Jones. Helps. Mrs. Comes Jones to comes and helps. Yes. So it's like a whole progressive story world. Within. Yes, although Mrs. Harris and Suki and Mrs. Jones don't actually exist, so they're not real. Characters. Oh, I see. Yeah. So what happens is we have to look at who out of the team of interpreters are free and then work and slot us into the characters depending on who it is and who's there. There have been times when all four people are potentially Mrs. Crocombe's. Oh, we've really? had to work out how we can slot that in because technically one of the interpretive points we want to make are the age differences. Mm -hmm. So La An Annie Chase, the scullery made the lowest, is technically 17. Mrs. Crocombe is 43 and the other two girls are 20-ish and early 30s. So we want to try and reflect that. Are you a living historian full-time? Is that like your full-time mm -hmm. job? And is that normal? Like, do people usually like I'm a living historian or is it like I suppose I'm a part-time you know I have another job I'm an accountant well we enter the sticky uh, definitions of what different people do yes then, the world of um, so if you're we tend to call people who are paid professionals so they're paid to do it um, tend to like terms like a historical interpreter or museum performer um, museum actors I've seen as called and then there's the because it's a new industry really, uh, heritage sites and museums have only just really, in the last 20 years, really picked up on using people in costume to, te to teach and to spread history. Well it's really effective. I mean I was just sort of standing in the back of the room listening to the people and you just, as you're standing there speaking, you just sort of gather this crowd of people who are then interested, more interested I would say than if you see an object in a museum because mm. like it's just but you can hear her speaking and walking around and you were just saying earlier there's a group of people in the other part of just, the room in the pub did. they were really engaged they were asking us really interesting questions they didn't have children a lot of people think because we're in costume we are there for the children so only families with children come and ask questions or well, they actually you see people push their children forward saying ask them a question when really actually the adults want to ask questions and so these are um, there's three of them there are adults I think there's three they might be four they are actually engaged directly with us which is always lovely and, and they're still ask, talking about it in there they're finding out how big the population is in in 1881 they're googling it which yeah is great yeah well, I find something that happens often with adults coming is that they want to tell you about their family and how they might have had a relative who worked in the service or they have brought a collection of um, Victorian aprons down from their attic and they're giving them do to people us. do that oh yeah oh wow um, which I find just hearing people's stories to be such an interesting part of working. Well, it brings an element of human connection to it. Which is really important because yeah. uh, it's our history, isn't it? 
Yeah, uh, it's yeah, it's all well and good seeing, um, say, King Henry at uh, at a castle or a man in armor on a horse, which is great. Obviously, we need to see that element, but there's only a few small bits of society that are party to that or who understand what that really means. Mm. Whereas if you're playing somebody normal like Mrs. Croker, mm. then it's it immediately engages people because they have relatives who were that. Very few people have relatives who were King Henry VIII. Mm. So it's nice. It's nice that you can come in and, and see the house and, and and see people living in it. I think it brings it alive. Yeah. That's really important and engaging in this way so people can ask us questions. And I think these winter weekends give us more time because the house isn't open and there isn't more things to do so they come and spend a lot of time with us this, this time round. And that's great. Mm. At other sites we work at sometimes there's so much on. People want to engage but they're also aware that you know, in half an hour something else is going to mm. start so they need to run off and do it. Yeah. So you don't just do oddly end. No. So yes, to go back to your question, yes. which was, because uh, I got a, um, yes. So I call myself a historical interpreter, and I do it okay. full time. Yes. But as part of that, I also have a theatre company. But we are based in Heritage, right. so our theatre is all is is mostly focused on um, history and bringing history alive and making a drama out of history. It's what our little tagline, and so we create plays that are specifically. They're quite bespoke. Some of them specifically about historical event or teaching about history but I'm in costume nearly every day of some kind mm. oh wow but you can take courses in it now in so living really? history in, in museum interpretation wow that's <laughs> really cool and museum heritage and oh, interpreting museum. I wouldn't be surprised if soon um, certain drama courses start thinking about um, training people to do this because it's very different to acting because you don't have a script yeah because you're trained different. you're trained as an actor yes um, as, as a trained mind. actor uh, well, yeah, well yeah, Kathy is a trained actor too. Mm. okay so spill oh. the tea how, how is this different there's no script there's no structure necessarily there might be an outline when you work as an actor um, every word is given to you mm. you tell you say that word depending on your director how you say every word, what you do on every word is, is directed. Whereas here, you're supposed to try and embody um, the time, the period, the language use. While also cooking. Oh yes, yeah, that's a specific thing to all do. Though. Yes. You don't have to yes. do that other places. Okay, so the people who do living history and reenactment mm -hmm. and the other one, historical, historical interpretation. Yes. Got it. Are they typically actors or are they historians? No, I would say um, there's kind of three routes into it, of which I belong to two actually. So you can be an actor and you're really keen on history, so you might join then. Uh, you could be an actor who's out of work and is looking for something that might fill in the gap. And then you stumble across someone like Past Pleasures and think, oh, actually, that's really interesting. And so you learn all your history from there through that. There are, you know, academic historians mm. who want to tell the story of history, but do it this way. Some of them are authors as well, but they, they want to do it this way as well. Dress up, they like to dress up, they like to feel. Um, and then there's the reenactor. Um, and reenactment is a hobby, so you might do it at weekends and primarily, or no, not all of it, is based around a battle or a significant mm. historical event. Um, and so on a weekend you would go and you'd live like a, a Viking or an early medieval or a civil war. And so from there you might think, actually I really enjoy talking to the public about this. The thing about the, some of the reenactment events is people are there because they want to be part of it. They're not necessarily thinking about how the public is viewing it. Mm. They want to be part of this, which is great. That's how I started. I trained as an actor, but I was also a reenactor. And uh, I had no concept of half the time where even the public were that were watching it because I was within the battle and I was, you know, so. But then there might be some who were like, actually, I want to talk to the public about this. I want them, I've learned so much, I want to share that knowledge. And so some. Um, professionals now started as a reenactor and have moved in towards working in their local museum or working in their local heritage site or have joined other groups um, maybe uh, worked for past pleasures or a couple of other organizations that bring these kind of like-minded people together so you get a scenario sent to you which is broken down a little bit um, but prime and then you'll get a pack that's sent like the one you had for Audley that gives you background and some of it is not relevant so necessarily to your character so the finances of the king's court at the time which are quite detailed um, I, I felt like at the time 
that could be my last bit of reading. So you just have to work out what you want to read. Prioritize. Then there's, there's also a reading list, and the reading. My bookshelves are full. I started at Hampton Court, so it's all Henry the, Henry the Eighth. Then I went to the Tower of London, and so that's Edward the First. A lot of that. So you just extend your book collection; it grows and grows and grows. And you don't read them from cover to cover. You just dip in and out of the bits that you want to to read on. Well, let's say playing a character like one of the people from the village who weren't real, but um, in order to flesh them out, you get a lot of freedom. Mm -hmm. You encouraged me to craft a backstory for Suki, and I think that became an opportunity for me as an interpreter to talk about things that I knew about that might not have been in the research pack for all the end. As an interpreter, having your own interests mm. um, that work in conjunction with what the main scenario is, I think there's so many times when you can insert that in. Someone coming to all the end might not um, know they're going to hear about a burned down home in mm. Warwickshire where or, or Mrs. poets... Mrs. Crocombe's obsession with meat coming from New Zealand. <laughs> yeah. It was Australia last time. Or was it? Yeah. Mm. But it's what you're uh, interested in and or the projects that you might have worked on. So um, a lot of the team work, they're, educa they're educators as well. Mm. They'll be running school sessions at either the Tower or at Kensington Palace or at Hampton Court. So for those particular school sessions, they might really focus on one particular time. It's just building up knowledge, really. Um, but when you get, let's imagine um, you, you were coming to play, say, Marianne, <laughs> the first thing you'd want to do is to find out where she lived and where she came from. Yeah. So you can describe that and you can fall back on that at any time. Or when I, I've got mm. a sister and she works here. So it's good to flesh out your family because people do talk about their families. One of the first things people come in and say to us, oh, my great aunt was this and she was. Mm. So you as a because they're real people you need to find out um who your family are but then find out it's not so much orderly because we know which characters we're going to play one interesting thing i kind of found navigating as an interpreter is playing a low status individual who might not have all the information but being the interpreter who preempting that visitors will ask you questions that some a character of your of your status would not know, um, but not wanting to fall back on, I'm the new maid, I don't know, all the time. That this took a bit of figuring out. And you need to work out, so you can mm. say, I did hear Mrs. Crocom say, yeah. and I do lots of, I read in the newspaper, Mrs. Crocom mm. does lots of reading. <laughs> She's <laughs> a well-read woman. Especially because we've worked so extensively in Henry VIII's time, um, and I know quite a bit about the food from there. When people ask about, say, the meat and the mince meat, you, you want to say, well, in Henry VIII's time, it's different. But obviously, Mrs. Croken wouldn't necessarily know that unless she'd read a book on it. So she yes. reads articles in the newspaper all the time. Oh, you did say something about Henry VIII today. That's mm, mm, because I've just, done done yeah. meat, right? I've just been. I've just done a Tudor cooking weekend oh. where I cooked mince meat. So it's there in my mind, and it's how you bring it in. You know, I could have had a brother who was particularly interested in Henry VIII. Because we're Victorian, we've got a lot of history we can refer to. Right. But would a cook know all about mm. history? Um, then when you're in Henry VIII's time, you don't know, you, know, you can only know what's gone before. Yes, fleshing out and how you interact with characters. So um, at Hampton Court, say, you might be a duchess who is a lady in waiting to the queen, whichever queen it is, um, but then there might be an, a lord on and you've got to say, does that, does she have a relationship already with him? You have to go through their family trees, uh, they're probably related in some mm. way to a third cousin twice removed or something. And then so you can talk to them, because a lot of the time we meet what we call meeting and greeting, mm. where we're not having a structured conversation, we're having this kind of conversation, but we're in character. So as an actor, it kind of forces you to flex so many muscles at once. Like there's so many layers when I'm interpreting that are all like going on at the same time. So you have, you know, I'm in a different time period. I'm in a completely different career path than mm. me, my character. If it's someone who we know a bit about, like even Annie Chase or Sylvia, where you have where she's from, how she sounds, then you also have what you know as the interpreter about the site and the time period. There's a lot mm. going on. As mm. an actor, it's completely different than getting a script. And it's completely different than going to an improv class. But it takes a lot of 
improvisational skills. And then also the multitasking of cooking in real time. Yes, yes, that is an added layer. <laughs> I'd struggle with the with the interaction though, because the depends. interaction with um, other characters or with the public? Both. <laughs> it's quite interaction different. with all humans in general. <laughs> with the other characters, it's always fun. Because once you kind of get to know um, who you're working can, with yes. and how they interact, you know yeah. kind of what you can throw at each other. And that's primarily uh, the most important thing is that you can trust the people you're working with and um, that they're not just going to stand there and say everything they have to say yeah. and then not pass it on to, yeah. to you. When you're playing the highest status character, that is one of the most hardest things not to do, is for me to just come in, take over and never let you speak <laughs> because you wouldn't interrupt me because I'm the highest. So that's, and that's quite challenging, not just for Mrs. Crocombe, but for those who play the kings mm. um, or the queens or anything. Mrs. Crocombe is like, the queen in that she scenario. Is, she is the queen. But the difficult thing about a character like Mrs. Crocombe that's not Henry VIII is that there aren't written sources about her character, right? Yeah, it's nothing. So it's kind of interpreted by you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have to interpret what we think, yeah, it's quite difficult, what we think she would have done, how she would have thought, how would she have spoken. We all, six of us, play her with a different Yeah, accent. I was going to say, like, do the six of you play a completely different yes. Mrs. Crocombe? Yes. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see different elements of her character as we have interpreted her. Wow, and in a weird way, now people on the internet are just assuming Obsessed. that Mrs. Crocombe has this face. Mm, yeah. And that personality. She's a very shady lady <laughs> with a lot of snark. And they're interpreting, what they've done is we've chosen to interpret different elements of it. So I would say one of the interpreters, she interprets the fact that we know in a few years time she will have married, she will have retired and married. Ah. So some of them are like, yeah, this is as high as I can get. I'm quite happy, you just get on with it girls. I don't need to worry, I'm fine. And I'm towards the end of my career. Wow. To, to unpack that. Yeah. And also that, uh, I'd say one of the interpreters is very comfortable in where she is. She's completely in control. She's very comfortable, very relaxed, just chatting about stuff. More so necessary than I'm in charge type character. So we all play her slightly differently. I it's think. really fun to be a part of. I've, I like to say I've collected most of the crocums in yes. terms of in my time working at Oddly. I've worked with at least four of the six. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we are all different, aren't we? Completely different. Yes. And it's such a treat, because I, I know which ones are more forgiving, which ones are stern, and you you watch out for. <laughs> <laughs> How does Kathy rate on a scale from? I wouldn't be surprised. I, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if it depends on the mood I'm actually in. Oh! <laughs> it depends on how tired I am. Uh, yeah. Well, it's funny because I could not tell when you were in or out of character when we met the first time. You said, like, clearly she was out of character, and I was like, really? I couldn't tell. Ah, oh, yeah. Well, I can tell when you're switching modes. So you do bring an element of yourself to it. Yeah, you have to, don't you? To, to be able I to imagine so. Yes, I think so. So we got pushed out of character a little bit today, didn't we? The public came in, a family from Poland, oh. and we got pushed out of character. <laughs> no, no, what's new? And we started talking about the difference between our food and Polish food, mm. which of course Mrs. Crokin wouldn't necessarily engage in a conversation in that way. Right. It's Polish, but then there wouldn't be people coming into her kitchen. So we kind of uh, moved on to, to Polish food today and what they would eat for Christmas. So we do get... I was on. wondering today because I was sort of loitering in the back while mm. you were talking to that large group of people and you were going on about the chocolate. Oh yes. And you were trying to explain it as it would have been in the Victorian period, bitter mm -hmm. and expensive and not consumed by children. But of course, you know, everyone in the room is picturing, you know, Cadbury's or whatever. Orange. Right, yes. Right, so are there ever instances where you're like, how do I convey within the historical context that what I'm describing is not what they're picturing? Because you did kind of get that across in the end. I did, yes. Um, uh, my, my, that particular instant, I had massive doubts in my knowledge. This is the problem with uh, the kitchen, really, is you don't know where you're going to end up. So you could be talking about chocolate, you could be talking about ice, you've missed a type I've watched you I get into a huge thing about food colouring. Food colouring. Um, so, and, and really, I always, I start these and then I was like, oh no, hang on, I don't know that I know that for sure. And was that that or was that some, and then the doubt comes and then you're like, let's just move to something I really know about. And sometimes that's the best thing. When in doubt, talk about what you know about. But does that ever 
Because if that were me, like I'd go home with a list, like okay, now I have to research chocolate and the, the, the lineage of chocolate and food coloring and you could realize well, like as you're having these conversations and people are asking questions yes. you're like I don't know this thing let me go research and you end up with this really in-depth um, mm, knowledge random knowledge oh. yes and obviously um, there are lots of books out there so I've been lent some by one of our don't say that a hundred people are gonna go into the comments asking me for book recommendations okay how do people go and find books and resources on these very niche <laughs> elements of history. It's Google, really. Or, um, oh, depending the on... Library. The, the library. The library. Whoa! Yes, go to the library. Yes. I spent hours in the Rotten. Swiss Cottage Library. Yeah, certainly am. But also, anything that Annie's written will have loads of book references. Yeah. Mm. If you're reading oh, something by a reputable story. scholar, if you go into the back of the book, into the bibliography, it's all a whole list of further... Mm. I mean, the sources that they referenced for the book which ideally, hopefully, some of them, most of them are primary sources, which are actual historical sources that you can then Google search and go find for yourself and actually read those because those will be hugely and useful. And some, some of them have been reprinted, like Eliza Acton that we use, she's, you can get her reprints, which we've got in the break room. Trust the sources that are cited and then go and have a look at those citations and see if the citations are reputable because if they are citing a primary source, something that was actually written in the Victorian period, for example, you know, then that's, I mean... But also we interpret things differently, don't we? Yes. So you might read yeah. something and you say, oh, I take that from it. And you put right. it in your book. Mm -hmm. And then I might read it and say, oh, no, I take this from it. Right. But what you do, what you do as an interpreter is primarily you um, learn to streamline. Mm -hmm. Especially at Audley, you think this is what the public will be interested in. Sometimes mm -hmm. you might get pushed into a topic you're not so um, well informed on. But then you just say, I'm really sorry, I don't know. Um, but you learn, to, you know what the vast majority of the questions will be. So you learn about that specifically. Um, and you get to a habit as an interpreter. So when you're given a, uh, a new project, whether it's Victorian or anything, you kind of think, I know what the public want from this. To a certain extent. You'll always get one or two people who are like, oh, so, you know, where did they get those buttons from? Or whatever. Mm. But um, <laughs> there's always some. I was just thinking of you, actually. <laughs> Isn't this seam hand stitch? See, that's how you start, and then as you go on, there's interests that you want to do. So, like turkeys and boots. Uh, like turkeys and boots, and Marianne, one of the Marianne's, uh, really went into quite a lot of detail about the house they rented in Bournemouth. So she looked into Victorians on holiday in Bournemouth. You know, so you, it's what you want to do, what you want to bring in for a long-term project like this. For the other projects that past pleasures run, at the Tower, for example, things run almost um, monthly or a school holiday length and then you might never do that topic again until next year mm. so you don't get so long to indulge in reading up on mm. specific things in a particular era and time because we've been in 1881 for 11 years so you can be quite yeah you can get you can completely drown in that time if you want oh yeah. my god this is like extreme history mm. it is extreme Oddly, history. us trying to talk about the Crimean War yes that exactly. was a good weekend okay so it has been wonderful. This has been a lovely conversation. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you got some hand sewing done whilst you were listening to oh, us yes. rattle on about stuff. Please don't roast Mrs. Crocombe in the comments. She's, she's, <laughs> roast she's chestnuts, roasted. not Mrs. Crocombe. I feel quite roasted anyway. No. I'm very red. I didn't oh, drink enough oh, okay. while I was working. Mm, so oh, okay. When you're um, doing interpretation, drink. That's my lesson for today. That is the takeaway <laughs> advice. So maybe you are inspired to go into living history or interpretation or reenactment or whatever it is you decide to call it. It's fun and you get to learn a lot about history or you can just be like me and learn about history and then YouTube so it, because people are scary. But so thank you, Kathy, That's for coming right. You're welcome, and you. to the pub with us and having a little <laughs> chat. Hannah had no choice. But thank you for sitting here. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank you for being my partner in crime and all of this. This is Crocom adventuring. And look where we are now. Look where we in are. a pub. What the heck happened? Have a good new year. Yes. Because the last video went up on New Year's Eve. That's so magical. The biscuits one went on New Year's we, Eve. We, we filmed, filmed it, on it on New Year's Eve. I think it went uh, up on the 6th. You know. Okay. Oh. Bye. Okay, how are you doing? <laughs> good boy.